السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي uh, How many minutes do I have? How many minutes do I have? A bit less than 20 Okay, a bit less than 20 <laughs> So I got to talk to you about what is love in a bit less than 20 So this is a big topic. I'm gonna do my best, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this. Uh, this is a huge conversation, and it's a very very important conversation. <laughs> like, I I truly believe that there isn't a more important conversation, and that's a big statement. I do not believe that there is a more important conversation than this conversation, which is what is love. And I'm going to tell you why I believe this is such an important conversation. In fact, the most important conversation we can have as human beings. And that is because the way that our creator designed us is that our greatest and most powerful motivator is love. Our greatest and most powerful motivator, this is our fitrah, this is our design, is love. It is love, ironically, for the wrong things, that make nations go and bomb other nations. It is a love of power. It is love of wealth. It is love of domination. It is love that will make a person give up their life for another person. It is love that will make a person shoot another person because they want their sneakers. It is love of wealth or love of status. And so we all need to be talking about love <laughs> because love is extremely powerful. And if we love the wrong things in the wrong way, we can actually destroy the world. That is, that is a fact. And we are seeing the world getting destroyed because of that wrong love for the wrong things. We have entire governments, entire nations that have no problem killing women and children because they love to stay in power. And we're seeing that right now. So talking about love, this isn't a small topic. This isn't like a, you know, we're just sitting here talking about rom-coms. This is a very deeply important topic. And we need to understand what love actually is and how loving in the wrong way can, in fact, not only destroy you, but can destroy the world. So I, that's big. That's important. I want to begin by saying this. I'm going to narrow my topic to romantic love. All right, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, in the topic of romantic love, I'm going to say a few things. I'm going to list a few mistakes that we make or a few pitfalls that we fall into in, t in terms of this, under this topic of romantic love. The first one I'm going to begin with is what I believe is the most important. And that is this. It is a mistake that so many people make It is a mistake I made. It is a mistake I think the sister was saying she made. Many people make this mistake. And that is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created love. And I'm going to put it this way. Allah created different kinds of love. Allah created, in, 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 for, for a more clear explanation to simplify, Allah created different compartments within our heart to contain love and different kinds of love. Now, Everything is fine as long as you keep the proper love in the proper compartment, okay? And I, and I said earlier that I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. My book is basically centered around this concept, is that there are different compartments within the heart, and each compartment is created for a specific kind of love. And as long as you keep everything in its proper compartment, you'll be okay. But the moment that you put things in the wrong compartment within your heart, that is when the real damage happens. And you guys are probably wondering what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you an analogy before I explain what I'm talking about. Have y'all ever gone to a gas station before? Okay, excellent. And when you get to the gas station, imagine one day you get to the gas station and you, and you pull up and you realize that you just think that gas is too expensive that day. But you notice that there's a sign for orange juice. And orange juice happens to be on sale because it's, it's sunny delight. It's not real juice. And you say to yourself, you know what, I'm a little cheap. And I'm going to just put orange juice in my gas tank because it's cheaper. What's going to happen to your car when you put orange juice in the gas tank instead of gas? Because it's cheaper. Any, anyone? 
Any mechanics in the room? Y'all don't have to be a mechanic to know that you're gonna destroy the car. Fair enough? You're gonna destroy the car. Not only is it not gonna run, but you've actually broken the car. You feel me? Okay. So within the human heart, there is a compartment, just like a gas tank. And that compartment, just like a gas tank, is only made to hold a certain type of thing. A gas tank is only created to be able to handle gas, filling it up. But if you put orange juice in that gas tank, you destroy the gas tank and you destroy the entire car. Now, what does that have to do with the human heart? See, there's this part in the heart, and I will call this the lub of the heart. It is the very most central, most inner part of the heart. This isn't normal love. No, this is the center of our existence. This is what I live for and what I will die for. This isn't just love, this is worship. It's the kind of love that becomes worship. But it's not worship in the sense that you're praying to this thing. People don't pray to money, but they worship money. And the reason why they do that is because their love of money is in this central part of their heart that was only created for the love of God. So you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that within the human heart, there's an innermost part that's like a gas tank. It's only created for gas. In, this, in the case of the heart, it's only created for the love of God, Allah. This is, in other words, I'm gonna call this an ilah. Ilah. When you become Muslim, every single day when you pray, as a believer, you say this every single day. Many times a day you say, La ilaha illallah. What do, do we even know what we're saying? We, we don't actually know what we're saying. We're not only saying there's no God but Allah. Because then you think, okay, there's no creator but Allah. This is true. But essentially what we're saying is that there's nothing that goes in the core of the heart except for Allah. Except for God. Whatever language you want to say it, the creator, the ultimate, the almighty is the only one who goes in that central part of my heart and of my life. That's what la ilaha illallah is at a core level. And that is why a person will become destroyed, destroyed, destroyed if they put anything else in that core level. Just like the car becomes destroyed when you put orange juice in it, yeah? Just like a car becomes destroyed because you put orange juice in the gas tank, a human being, a society, a family, the entire world becomes destroyed if you put anything else in that core level other than God. Now, what does that mean? It means if I put money there. It means if I put status there. It means if I put power there. It means even if I put another person there. You guys following? I'm talking to a room with a lot of women. And you know, subhanAllah, no one teaches us this. I will tell you I wasn't taught this. Because I was taught, you just love. You just love. Love is always just it, right? It's, it's, it's always, I wasn't taught that there's a wrong and a right way to love. I wasn't, in my Islamic upbringing, this was not taught to me. And I had to learn it the hard way. And I'm talking blood, sweat, and tears. And that's how Reclaim Your Heart happened, by the way. That's how my book happened, is blood, sweat, and tears, learning this one lesson, just this one lesson, the hard way. And I'm here to tell you the easy way. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, don't do it. Because what happens is, even another human being, and I'm talking now your spouse, yeah? Like your spouse. What are you supposed to love your spouse? But if you put your spouse in that central most part of the heart that's saved for Allah, and I'll give you examples, you will actually be destroyed. And when I say you'll be destroyed, I mean that you will endure a lot of pain. Well, I just put it that way. You will endure a lot of pain and you actually cause a lot of pain. Because no one, Allah did not create the human heart to, to have the capacity to, to even contain anything else in that central part of your heart. It's like taking something other than Allah and making it an ilah. Believe me, an ilah is not just a, a stone idol. An ilah is not just a stone idol that you pray to. An ilah is essentially at its root, if you study the term, if you study the root of the word ilah, you see that it is anything that you put at the center of your existence. It becomes that which dictates every single thing you do or don't do. 
It dictates why you live, why you die. It dictates how you act and how you don't act. An ilah is a master. An ilah is a master. And the problem is, this is a lesson you'll always have to remember. Whatever you love most in life is your master. Simple as that. Whatever you love most in your life is your master. If that is money, then you are a slave to money. If that is your spouse, then you are a slave to your spouse. If it is your children, and now I'm talking about something that's just like blows your mind as a woman, especially as a mother and as a father. We definitely ain't taught this, that there's a wrong way to love our children. What? There is a wrong way to love your children. Why do you think we have so many problems with the whole mother-in-law issue? Do you want to know the reason? Anybody want to know the reason? This is the reason. It's because the dynamic to begin with from day one was unhealthy. I'm telling you guys something maybe we don't want to hear, but it's the truth. The dynamic was, was unhealthy from day one because that boy, that son of yours was never supposed to be in that part. That part is saved for Allah. Your life was never supposed to revolve around your children. I know it's like, what? Your life was never meant to revolve around your children. It's unhealthy. And actually, your life is supposed to revolve around Allah. This is something we're not taught. But it's unhealthy and it creates unhealthy, um, circum unhealthy consequences. And yes, that is why we have an issue then when the, when the son grows up and now he's getting married and all of a sudden there's a competition. There's not supposed to be a competition between a wife and a mom. That doesn't even make any sense. But the fact that there is, is only because the dynamic from day one was unhealthy and it was wrong. They taught you that you're supposed to revolve your life around your son, namely your son. They taught you that that's actually how to be a good mom. It's not how to be a good mom. It's unhealthy. Your life continues to revolve around Allah, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you're a mother or you're not a mother. And only when you're central point in your life is Allah, your greatest and deepest devotion and love is for Allah, only then, only then, and mark my words, only then will you have healthy relationships with the creation. Only then can you have a healthy relationship in a marriage and, and with your children and with your friends and with your colleagues. Only, only if you're putting everything in the right compartment. I'm not up here to tell you that you're not supposed to love your children. For God's sakes, <laughs> we love our children to death. I'm not here to tell you not supposed to love your spouse. I'm not even telling you not to love money. Love these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger made it halal. But what, do Allah, what does Allah warn us from? Allah warns us in the Quran, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ أَوْ أَبْنَاؤُكُمْ Allah in this ayah gives us a list of all halal things. All halal things. Say, if your fathers, meaning your parents, your sons, your children, and Allah lists eight, I think, halal things to love. And he says your parents, your children, your, your, your uh, spouse, your siblings, your wealth, your business, where you fear decline. All, is any of this halal? Is any of this haram? Does the ayah say your boyfriend or your gambling or your drinking habits? No, all halal. But Allah warns us. If any one of these things ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulah is more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger that's when you face a problem because even the halal if it's loved in the wrong way will cause much damage and this damage will be to yourself and others so the first thing i want to say is this we have to put things in their proper place when we say la ilaha illallah when we say there's no ilah except for Allah what we are saying is that nothing else goes in the core of our hearts and in the core of our lives. Nothing else do we revolve our existence around except for our Creator. And that can't be our money, it can't be our, our business, it can't be even our children or our spouse. It can't be status, it can't be power, it can't be our career. It can't be these things. And I'm gonna tell you guys another secret. Remember how I told you about orange juice in the gas tank, right? Um, how do you know? How do you know that you're loving something in the wrong way? I'm gonna give you a very easy way to know. 
it's gonna hurt like heck. It's not gonna feel good. It's not gonna feel right because the car knows that you just put orange juice inside of the gas tank. The car feels it. It doesn't run right. It actually ain't gonna run. It's not gonna run at all. So the way that you and I will know that we have things in the wrong compartment is that we become tormented by that which we put at the center where only Allah should be. Is that making sense? If that is your business, you will not sleep because of your always your worry about your business. If it's your career, you won't be sleeping. You'll need to start taking pills to just calm yourself down. Because you put, and that's a sign, it's because you put it in the wrong compartment. If it's your children, same thing's gonna happen. They are going to torture you. And I'm not talking the normal torture, yeah? I'm talking a different kind of level of torture, of torment. If it's your spouse, even your spouse, you'll know because you'll feel it. You'll feel that pain. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us we need to move things around. We need to put Allah back at the center. You know when I mentioned this whole thing about um, uh, us mothers when we raise our children and if we have that dynamic incorrectly what happens when they get older is it's kind of like well I did tawaf around this boy my entire life and now you think you're gonna come and take him away uh -uh. right fair enough <laughs> y'all were you weren't supposed to be doing tawaf around him ever like that this 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 concept that your life begins and ends at your son was never healthy. No, that's not what it means to be a good mom. What it means to be a good mother is you have Allah at the center, and then you love your children, and then you love your spouse, and then you love everyone else, but Allah's at the center. You don't put Allah aside, you don't put Salah aside because you got soccer practice, you feel me? Oh, but I have to take my kid to X, Y, Z, every kind of activity in the universe, but I'm missing my Salah. That means my priorities are off or I gotta cook this so I'm missing salah. That's, that means that my priorities are off. And you're gonna find this. If someone that you love doesn't like your hijab, doesn't like it, doesn't look nice. Someone you wanna marry, right? Or someone that you're already married to, doesn't like your hijab. Well, now it's a question, what's at the center, right? Because you're, you're being actually cho told to choose. We have to make sure, make sure that we have the right thing at the center. If it is not Allah and His Messenger, if it is not Allah and His Messenger, we suffer and then we make others suffer. So that's the, that's the main thing I want to emphasize. And I actually don't have time to get to the other points because I had less than 20 minutes to talk about love. But I will say this very quickly. I will say this very quickly. Um, I do go into more detail about all this in my book, but Something else I want to say quickly, and I won't have much time to emphasize it. Some other pitfalls we fall into when it comes to romantic love. One of the big ones is that we focus on the surface and we miss what's inside. Now, obviously, in terms of appearance, yes, this is, this is an obvious thing. I think many of you already know about this. But there's another level of this which I've seen and I've experienced, and that is that a lot of times we mistaken, as the sister said, what I call surface romance, we mistaken surface romance for deep connection. And the two are very, very different. See, you might have a man or a woman who does these things for you, these things and these gestures that, this, that the sister was mentioning, the roses and the surprises and all of that. And you may believe, you may believe that that means that you have a connection. But there is a very, very big difference between surface romance and deep connection. Deep connection is about, and these are big terms, deep connection is about compatibility, deep connection is about vulnerability. Deep connection cannot only just be in these gestures. So I advise you and all those who are looking, for example, for marriage, look deeper. You, and, and, and one last thing I wanna say, uh, I will tell you and everyone who advises you will tell you look for Dean look for character Absolutely, those are a must, but I will also tell you that it is not enough. It is not enough And I'm gonna say this and I know this from experience what I speak about I know from experience that it is not enough 
and there are many examples, namely even in our, in our tradition, we know, for example, um, great people, Zain, Zayd and Zainab, they were both amazing character, they both uh, amazing, um, you know, had amazing morals and deen, but they were not compatible. They were not compatible and so they actually got divorced. And so what I want to say to you is that, yes, you look for deen, yes, you look for uh, character, but it is, it is necessary, but not sufficient. It is not sufficient, you have to, have to, and I cannot emphasize this enough, you have to look for compatibility. You have to look for compatibility. And I'm not just talking about surface compatibility. I'm not just talking about, I'm from Egypt, he's from Egypt, and so we're compatible. Mm -mm. Right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a deeper level of compatibility, and that's again a whole other discussion. Very inspiring words, and a lot of questions that came from them. <laughs> um, a lot of questions, thank you. Um, but with that being said, please. Don't hold your hopes really high in me asking your questions, because there are a lot. Um, some of the questions were answered through the talk, so I might not go back to those. And some of the questions are going to be paraphr paraphrased to include multiple questions. So our first question is, how do you put Allah back at the center of your heart? OK, great question. Next time, we shouldn't only have 20 minutes, right? <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a huge question. Uh, but I'm going to give you guys uh, the shortest answer I can think of, okay? So, in order to take care of the body, we have certain needs, all right? Everybody knows them. One essential, most essential need for a body is what? Before water. You can live for a few days without water. But what can't you live with? Oxygen, folks. You cannot live more than a few minutes without oxygen, okay? And, or seconds. Oxygen is essential for you to stay alive physically. You also need spiritual oxygen to stay alive spiritually. The spiritual oxygen is your salah. You, you cannot have any relationship, you cannot claim to have a relationship, a true deep relationship with your creator if you aren't praying and you aren't praying on time. And that's a fact and that's just like a fact. You have to pray and you have to pray on time and that's the most that's the foundation of your your relationship with Allah that's why it's the first thing you're asked about on the day of judgment as the prophet said said if it's if it's in order then the person will have succeeded and if it's not the person will have failed the salah is number one that's your oxygen it's keeping you alive same way if you know you don't say um you know what I I'm really busy today I'm studying for an exam so I, I'm gonna breathe tomorrow you don't say, um, I'm going to breathe tonight because I'm on Facebook or I'm at the mall. Like, it doesn't work out like that. Um, or I'm in a meeting, a very important business meeting, so I'm just going to breathe in a few hours. You feel me? You can't do that physically. You know you can't do that because you'll die. And it's the same thing spiritually with your salah. You will not survive unless you are taking the oxygen spiritually of the salah and make sure it's on time. If I gave you a prescription as a doctor and said, ma'am, I'm very sorry, you're, you're, you're very ill and you need to take this medicine or sir, you need to take this medicine, it's keeping you alive, but you have to take it five times a day at certain times. There's no one who's gonna say, well, um, today I was busy so I'll take all five doses before I sleep, right? You're never going to do that because otherwise you'll die. No one's going to say, I'm going to miss a, cu uh, a few doses because um, I had something else to do. You feel me? So I said, the, the, the essential thing is your salah. And the more that you can solidify your salah, the more you will solidify your relationship with Allah. The salah, you know, first step is doing them and doing them all on time. And then the second step is trying to work on your khushua, on your, on your concentration. And one of the biggest parts of learning and building the concentration is learning the unmeaning of what you're saying. Even if you don't speak Arabic, you can learn the meaning of salah. If you were speaking to um, a king, or a king gave you a, a letter and it was in a language you didn't understand, you'd probably go through the effort of at least translating it, right? So we have the Qur'an, this is the word of not a king but Allah. And if we don't understand the language, we need to at least go through the effort of translating it. And the same thing when you're speaking. If you have a best friend and you're talking to them, but you're speaking in a language that you don't understand, like you're speaking Chinese, 
how close will your relationship be? When you're speaking to someone, you need to know what you're saying. So when you're speaking in salah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least learn what you're saying for those parts of the salah, the minimum at least. And then I'm going to add um, something else. Uh, and that is that the relationship with the Quran, make sure it's a daily relationship and that you're understanding, you're not just reading, but you're understanding. Again, the letter, the example of the letter from the king and Allah is high above any analogy. And finally, I'll say this, in order to take care of the body, you need to, oxygen, you need to feed the body, obviously. And the, the food of the body is the Quran and the remembrance of Allah. But you also, and I'm gonna add one other thing, the athkar. If you can add athkar into your daily routine, you will find that your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become much, much stronger and your emotional and psychological state will become much more uh, stable. And that's, that's also something I've learned um, experientially. Uh, th lastly, you have to protect and clean the body. No one says, I, I don't need to take a shower today because I did that last November or last October. Um, that would be problematic and no one would want to be around you. And that's because you know that you have to consistently clean your body because dirt and sweat consistently build on the body, right? And in the same way, our hearts are constantly getting dirt on them from our sins. And that cleaning is istighfar, is the repentance that the Prophet ﷺ used to do a hundred times a day, right? And then what about us? So we have to constantly be asking for forgiveness. Istighfar consistently is cleaning. That's, that's your shower, all right? Internal shower. Um, and protecting the body, we need to protect our ears, our eyes, and our tongues because these are the openings to the heart. So that's kind of like in a nutshell, like an hour long lecture, um, but that's kind of the, in a nutshell how to take care of your heart and your, and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That actually took care of a lot of questions. <laughs> so perfect. Um, my next question, or the audience's next question is, how do you deal with those feelings of love when you are unmarried, especially if there is a love interest involved? Got that one. No, no, got that one. I am not going to touch that. That's a very good question. Um, how do you deal with matters of the heart when, especially, there's a love interest? Mashallah, uh, uh, Sister Yasmin, she talked about all of the, the, you know, we're talking about the end goal, love. So alhamdulillah, that, that covers part of that. But the practical steps of, you know, you, you have a love interest, you have to ask yourself, is there something I can actually do about it? Am I at an age where I can actually get married? Am I, at, is the person that I love or have a love interest in, is he or she, uh, is he or she at an age where they can get married? Is this something that's feasible? If it's somebody, it's not, if you're in a situation where it's not feasible because of age or because of whatever, then you, it's okay, number one, I should say, it's okay that you have, that you think somebody is special, that you have a crush on them, that's normal, right? But that second question is extremely important. Is there anything I can do about it? Number one, if they're already engaged or, or married, like them and that's it, it's done with. Okay, mashallah, great, he's a great person, I'll move on. Um, and and uh, uh, if it's because of, of age or because of, you know, you've tried for so many years and parents are just saying no, that's another issue, you, you have to move on. It's not the end of the world, right? If there is something you can do about it, go through the halal means, don't go through the back door. Don't say, you know what, I want to really get to know this person for three months and we're going to meet at Starbucks only so it's super halal because it's in public. And then we're going to tell our parents because if I tell my parents ahead of time, they're going to freak out and they're going to force me to marry this person. And we're going to be engaged for five years. <laughs> and then we're going to be married for five years. Oh, like engaged, this is engaged. Engaged, <laughs> engaged for five years. And that's another torture that opens a lot of doors <laughs> for things that could happen, right? That we, yes, yes. Being engaged for five years is not a good idea. So go through the front door. Go through the front door. The, if, uh, you know, sisters, if a brother is ready to man up and go talk to your father or your wali, you've got the right guy. This is a good start. If he says, no, no, you know what, like I said, we have to make sure we have a deep connection. This deep connection that Sister Yasmin talks about, this comes later. You just want to make sure there's some, you know, surface compatibility, there's some start, there's some place that you can start from to move forward. 
you go through the right channels, yes, brothers, you have to go to the, to the sister that you're interested in, her willy. Ask for, for say, may I speak to your father? May say, yes, you have to do that. If you don't have the courage to do that and you want to go through the back door, already the relationship is starting on the wrong foot. So that would be just a few nuggets of, uh, of, of advice, inshallah. May Allah SWT make that process easy, inshallah. And if I could just add something, oh, sorry. Yeah. Clap for her. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to add something, and that is, um, I'm, I'm noticing a trend, uh, more so with the coming generations than my generation, I guess. Uh, and that is, um, a lot of people just want to chit-chat. You feel me? They just want to chit-chat. And they want to keep chit-chatting, chit okay? And <laughs> chit-chatting. <laughs> and it's really fun, and it's cool, but don't want to actually commit. Please, to those people say, ain't nobody got time. Please be, yeah, may, may realize that your worth, your worth is far too high to waste your time with people just looking to chit chat. Okay? If a man, if a man, as she said, is actually serious about wanting to get married, he will want to approach your wali, your father, um, early on in the whole conversation. And if you find that he is absolutely um, hesitant about that, that step, then he may be a chit-chatter. <laughs> and ain't nobody got time for chit-chatters, I, I promise you. Um, and, and so what I'll say to you is please save yourself a lot of headache and heartache and time and don't even go down that road, all right? So one is, are you at a stage where you can get married? That's very important, obviously. But the other is, is this person actually serious about getting married or are they just looking to fill up some time because it's fun? Uh, and, and this whole idea, well, let's just be friends. Oh, no. Mm -mm. I'm, looking, I'm very serious and I'm looking for marriage and I'm not interested in just chit-chatting. So make sure that you have, you know, the, one of the <laughs> best, like, indicators is okay can you talk to my dad and 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 realize talking to someone's dad doesn't mean you're gonna do nikah the next day in 24 hours talking to someone's dad is just just means i'm serious about the intention of marriage it doesn't mean that now you, you you're halas that's it you're commit you're stuck talking to someone's dad doesn't mean you're stuck it just means that i am serious about this process and that's that need, we need to reinstitute that that, you know, that, that tradition, please, please, God, let's go back to that. But we, we as women have to kind of have boundaries, not kind of, we really have to have boundaries, and men too, brothers too. So I just wanted to add that little thing. The next question is kind of taking us back towards the beginning of the session, and it asks concerning the topic of loving yourself. Um, what if you feel like you have no real potential because you're constantly being surrounded by perfect, great people? How can you stop comparing yourself to others? Oh, can I just say something? <laughs> there is no such thing as perfect people. There's no such thing. I promise you it's a filter. It's a filter, okay? I'm telling you that this is one of the biggest problems of social media. Like I. I mean, I love social media, it's a great tool for so many great things, and I can go on and on about that, but one of the, the, the challenges of social media is that it gives the ability to sort of Photoshop your life, yeah? And, if you, and, and they have done studies to find that people who spend more time on social media also, have, also tend to be more dissatisfied with their own life. And that's because the nature of social media is that you can Photoshop it. You're not, you're not, you're taking a picture in the glamorous moments, right? And, and so it gives a very skewed image of a person's life. It even gives a skewed image of a person's face, right? Because it's not really what they look like. I mean, thank God for these, some of these filters, right? But the reality is do not ever, ever look at social media and then compare yourself to what this is it's like comparing yourself to a a model in a magazine that has been photoshopped like literally she they took like an eraser 
I'm not exact. I'm, they took an eraser and they took off parts of her waist and then took off parts of her arm and they enlarged certain parts, you feel me? That's what they do with Photoshop. But that's the same thing with social media. So number one, no one's life is perfect. No one is perfect. You're not perfect and neither is anyone else. We have to start to accept and love ourselves, accept and love the way Allah designed us. Allah did not design us as perfect because he already has angels, right? We're not even designed sinless. That's the design of Allah. It's not a mistake. You understand what I'm saying? Allah didn't do it by mistake. Allah has a design and a plan for us. And his design and his plan is that we will make mistakes, but the best of us are those who repent, are those who get back up when they fall. But to say that there are people out there, they just don't fall, they hover, you know? This is the problem. Like, we have this weird kind of idea, even about, like, like our, our public figures and our shiuch and our teachers, that they don't actually walk on the earth, they hover, you know? They, they just, they're like part of the, a different kind of realm. That's not true. That's not true. They're just as human as everyone else. Even prophets were human. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets as human beings for a reason. So that it, it's, it's the same as us. We can relate. So no, don't, don't fall into that deception of thinking that anybody's perfect. Our final question for the night, inshallah. Um, the question states that there have been marriages that have fallen due to two religious spouses. Mm. Um, so how can we stop this other extreme form of relationship? Other extreme. So it's instead of someone who loves, too, who loves their spouse too much, it's like, because I love God too much, I can't give you that affection. Oh, dear God. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, this is like my chance to rant. All right, my people. No, that's messed up. So here's the thing. I'm going to tell you guys a big secret, okay? The Prophet Sallallahu nobody loved God more than him. And if you study how he was with his wives, I mean, it's, it's like stuff that we would be like, oh my God, you know? Like, I'll give you an example. He's asked in a public place, like a public setting, who do you love most? Can you imagine like one of our shiuch in like one of these big settings, who do you love most? And he goes, Aisha, my wife. You know what I mean? He's publicly, pub he's not just showing affection in private in this case, right? Affection verbally, obviously. He's publicly announcing his love for his wife, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said, Aisha. And then he's, and this, this companion, this is the beautiful thing, companion thought he was going to say him. <laughs> you know? And so he's like, no, 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 from among the men? Because <laughs> he's thinking he's next. And he goes, her father. <laughs> but the point is that even when he's mentioning Abu Bakr Radulan, he uses Aisha as the reference point. Even the way he's talking about her, he doesn't even say Abu Bakr Radulan, he says her father. So, and, and the way he used to be with his wives, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, if, if he'd see her drinking from a cup, he would, put, he would see where she put her mouth and put his mouth on the same spot on purpose. That's how we showed, he showed affection. And there are many examples of this affection that they, that they had. This idea that you're so lost in God, you can't show affection, to, that's messed up. I'm sorry, but you're just lost. You're not just lost in God. And the reality is, the reality is that not showing affection is not a sign of, of spirituality. It's not a sign of, it's actually, it may be a sign of having a hard heart. And, the rea and that's, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu once saw a man, okay, there was a man who thought he was boasting and he said, I have all these children and I've never hugged or kissed them. He thought he was like getting extra points for that. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, what can I do if Allah's taken the mercy out of your heart? You understand? Like if, if, if mercy and compassion has been taken out of your heart, what can I do for you? This is not a, it's not a, it's not a sign of, of piety that you don't show affection. The Prophet Sallallahu was the most in love with God and he was the most affectionate. So that's what I want to say about that.
Jazakumullah khair, Sister Lubna and Sister Yasmin.